Harvard Divinity School. The Archaeology of Ecstasy, Psychedelics in the Ancient Mediterranean World, October 25th, 2021. Good evening. My name is Charles Stang, and I have the pleasure of serving as the director of the Center for the Study of World Religions here at Harvard Divinity School. And of course, you all know Zena, who often joins me for these events. Welcome to the second event in this year's series on psychedelics and the future of religion, a series now in its second year and part of the center's new initiative on transcendence and transformation, or TNT for short. As always, the best way to keep abreast of this series, the new initiative and everything else we do at the center is to sign up for our weekly newsletter. So if you missed our last event on the Native American church and peyote, that video is now posted to our website as is our event launching the new TNT initiative. We have many more events planned for this year's psychedelic series, but none yet firmly scheduled, so please stay tuned. The next event in the broader TNT initiative will be part of our Nociology series. On Wednesday, November 11th at 12 noon, Professor Yvonne Chereau from Swarthmore College will be giving a talk entitled Black Magic Matters hoodoo as ancestral religion, which will be hosted by my colleague Giovanna Parmigiani. Now it's my pleasure to welcome Karen Pollinger Foster and Andrew Coe this evening. Karen has recently retired from a long career as a lecturer in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations and the History of Art at Yale University. Andrew recently joined the faculty of Harvard's Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations coming from the MIT Center for Materials Research in Archaeology and Ethnology. And he's come here to Harvard to inaugurate a new interdisciplinary program in ancient pharmacology and medicine. Karen and Andrew will be speaking on the topic of the archaeology of ecstasy, psychedelics in the ancient Mediterranean world. This evening's event is a follow-up to my interview last year with Brian Murarescu, whose wildly popular book, The Immortality Key, brought attention to the contributions that archeology span and the more recent field of archeochemistry can bring to our understanding of the history of psychedelics and their use in ancient ritual and religious contexts. So this evening, we'll be asking whether and how archeology span can help us recover the ecstatic experiences of ancient peoples, in this case, from the Aegean and the Near East? And if so, what evidence is there that such ecstatic experiences were induced by what we now call psychedelics? To what degree was the ancient pursuit of ecstasy understood as an individual or a collective imperative or both? And in pursuing such questions as these, what do we learn not only about the ancient Mediterranean world, but about our own modern world? and especially the contemporary psychedelic renaissance and its priorities. So we have an hour and a half together this evening. I will soon disappear from the screen and Karen and Andrew will appear and speak one after the other in that order. And then I'll, I will reappear to host the Q&A session with both of them. So if you'd like to pose a question or a comment, you can do so with the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I imagine we'll get a good many questions and it's likely we'll only be able to get through a small number of them. But rest assured that we will pass on your questions and comments to our two guests so that they can see what their remarks provoked in you. So Karen and Andrew, thank you once again for joining us. And Karen, the floor is yours. All right, well, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be part of this event. And I only wish it could be somewhat in person. But on the other hand, I think that we have Zoomers from as far away as Australia. So I think that's pretty cool. OK, uh, next slide, please. One warm moonlit night at Knossos, Sir Arthur Evans, beset by fever, chanced to look down the grand staircase. As he wrote in the Palace of Minos, such was its, quote, strange power of imaginative suggestion that the whole place seemed to awaken a while to life and movement, as if the cupbearer and his fellows had stepped down from the walls and passed and repassed on the flights below. A century later, 
on a full moon evening in August, a visitor to the palace had an equally vivid moment. For her, it was the bull on the North Tower relief fresco, which appeared to come alive. These two waking dreams, the first by the man whose life work was the rediscovery of Minoan civilization, and the second by a complete non-specialist, make a compelling case for the transcendent ability of this art to engender visions and affect the mind's eye. But does it also betoken ecstatic psychedelic experience as both a memory and a stimulant? I think the answer is yes. And to convince you as well, I offer this evening a pair of case studies, one on Kamarasware and the other on the wall paintings from Zesty Three on Thera. In 1895, archeologists investigating the Kamaras cave on Mount Ida discovered dark lustrous pottery decorated with remarkable polychrome patterns. When a few years later, Evans excavated similar ceramics at Knossos, he called it Kamara Square, a name it's kept. The centers of production were the first Minoan palaces, especially Knossos and Festos. At its height in the 18th century BCE, there seems to have been no limit to its inventiveness, complexity, and technical prowess. No two pots are alike. Formal stylistic studies have isolated its decorative elements, some of which you see on the left. These twist, flow, whirl, and change direction over the entire vessel surface. In her seminal analysis, Gisela Valberg identified certain of these patterns that she felt to be uncomaris. As you see on the right, most are lattice grids of checkerboards and networks. These, I believe, should actually be acknowledged as paradigmatic form constants, integral to the psychedelic visual vocabulary and to the Kamara syntax. Now I'd like to show you seven representative um, examples. Okay, so here we are. I'd like to show you seven representative examples. We'll look first at the Kamara's pot and then pair it with a work of modern psychedelic art, bridging the gap of 3,500 years. So this is our first example. Um, you don't have to, uh, don't advance from here. So dominating this footed dish, four conjoined S spirals, two boldly serrated and two with interior disc spirals, illusionistically whirl around a central pair of petaloid loops. Between this and the rim are four loops filled with lattices. Visual instabilities of figure ground reversals abound. Focus on the center and the pattern shimmers, the dots scintillate and the form constants glow. The next. The next, yes. Fred Tomaselli regularly draws on the hallucinogenic experiences of his youth, coating his work with glossy resin so the colors and intricate forms pop against their black grounds. The outspread wings of his hummingbird seem to whir as nectar droplets spill from petals hanging from a dizzying array of spirals, dots, radiating motifs, and petaloid loops some even with serrated edges. Next. Here, an orange fish arcs in a sea shown above and below. A large petaloid loop emerges from its mouth, which presents a major ambiguity. Do we read the white lattice insects as a net signifier thrown out across dark waters, or the black inner shape as a fish signifier of catches once in future? As our brain goes back and forth, the marine scape begins to pulsate and the spirals running below each handle roll in waves around the vessel. The next. After taking LSD in the Dream Laboratory in New York, Isaac Abrams turned to painting and founded in 1963, the first gallery devoted to psychedelic art. In Flying Leap, a luminous blue field is alive with radiating and spiral form constants in which calligraphic black fish jump from the water and plunge back in splashes of white and red. The next. Four sets of foliated scrolls densely cover each side of this bridge spouted jar from Knossos. A special note here is a selective use of orange and crimson in outlining the small central circles, adding tiny eyes to the loops above the handles and highlighting the whirling motif at the heart of the scroll work. The colors flash as a strobe light does, 
augmenting the bigger ground reversal effects. Next. In the 1950s, the experimental psychologist Oscar Janiger began to investigate in depth the relationship between artistic creativity and LSD experience. As their trips progressed, the participants, himself included, made crayon sketches. This one has a very Camaris look. Streaks of orange shoot out in four directions from the attenuated ends of black incurved triangles, each of which has a tiny eye in its center. The next. Compared to the previous examples, this cup's decoration seems at first glance less complex, for its side is taken up by a single rotating device set within a white bordered circle. But as it spins its curving veins about a red ring center, the form constant acts powerfully and ambiguously, sometimes funneling us deep into a tunnel, other times pushing forward toward us, changing how we read the shape of the vessel. Next. In her 2005 work, Barbara Takanaga painted thousands of different sizes of dots in yellows and oranges on a black ground to create her own curvy veins, pinwheeling in ever expanding motion from a bright center. We soon find ourselves following individual strands of dots to enter into a quasi meditative state, but whether on a cosmic or microscopic scale is the ambiguity the artist offers for our contemplation. The next. As stick-like tangents to the hoop of a tunnel form constant, exuberant J spirals with latticed petaloid loops propel it into a kaleidoscopic sequence from its red center to the inner red ring to the joined semicircles at its circumference. <clears throat> Large red dots are seemingly randomly placed in the field, but as our eye traces a path from one to the next, they become stepping stones to a mind-altering visual experience. The next. The work of Fred Tomaselli again offers a thought-provoking modern analog. Millennium Phosphine Bloom features kaleidoscopic tunnel form constants against a black ground, in each of which appear several of the geometric elements seen in our Camaras jar, as well as tiny images of flowers, butterflies, and birds, and actual drug capsules. Next. The upper part of this ceramic relief vessel bears rows of white dot protuberances, their grid-like formation parting on each side of the jar for a circle filled with white dots ringed by red. The repetitive relief elements and white dots produce illusions of movement and visual instability, while the white and red dots challenge our figure ground and two three-dimensional perception. Next, Luis Tomasello, is among several optical artists using relief. In his reflection number 47, he set up small cubes in rows and columns, each pivoting at a slightly different angle from its neighbors, whose periodicity we strive to determine as the shadows create secondary illusions. Next, opposite the spout, free-formed curvilinear shapes illusionistically flow from the rim. Do we see a face, rosette eyes, handle nose, open mouth, luminous aura. But what of the naturalistically rendered a greamy goat? We appear to have moved into the later hallucinatory phase during which vision iconography can assume cultural significance. So it's not surprising to find an animal popular in the Minoan bestiary. Next. For modern analogs, there is much to choose from as depictions of hallucinatory experiences often show faces. Chiho Aoshimoa's City Glow animation. Faces emerge from facades morphing from and into a lush landscape with an exquisite crane in the starry sky, a staple of Japanese avian art. And next. In my time remaining, we now head north to the Cycladic island of Thera, where its volcano exploded about 1525 BCE in the largest eruption in Europe in the past 100,000 years. Spirit and Marinatus' spectacular discovery of a Bronze Age town buried in the eruption debris, and you see here some early photos that was just starting to emerge, earned the site the apt nickname, Pompeii of the Aegean. Next. 
As with the Vesuvian sites, the fall of volcanic ash produced, uh, protected a wealth of architecture and wall paintings, many of them still on their actual walls. By Aegean lights, this is an extraordinarily well-preserved fresco. In fact, one of the ones we'll be discussing. Next. My focus is on the splendid building known as SD3. Here you have a composite view of its elaborately decorated and constructed spaces. Each floor has multiple large and small scale murals. Their subjects include scenes of young women gathering saffron crocuses, monkeys playing musical instruments and brandishing swords, and an enthroned woman attended by a monkey and a leashed griffin. Next, please. Up on the top floor, several sets of monumental frescoes have now been conserved with more to come. On the north wall, directly above the enthroned woman, is a large composition known as the blue spirals. The red spirals cover the wall on the south side. In my opinion, these reflect altered states of consciousness and or induce psychedelic responses in the viewer with their illusions, colors, ambiguities, and form constants spinning us rapidly into other realms. Next, please. This is what the restored blue spirals look like. I would draw your attention especially to their precise optical geometry, the blue and red reversals, and the spiral embellishments, the dots running parallel within the spirals, the anther-like crescents along the scalloped edging, and the dot bordered discs in the J flourishes. Next. And you can see many of these out, oh, no, back one, please. And you can see many of these elements again in the restored red spirals. We'll come back to them in a moment so that you can see them um, at greater length. And then that, and now the next one. On the same floor as the spirals, we have the relief lozenges and rosettes, which turn a corner a short distance away. The illusion of throbbing wave-like movement comes from the undulating relief bands held together by perspectival rings as well as from the rosette variations. In some, Murex purple was used, whose extreme rarity in a G and wall painting creates a kind of visual hiccup in the brain. And now next, let's go back to the red spirals. Next. I show here uh, some modern analogs for two of its elements. On the right um, is a South American yarn image made to depict a peyote-induced vision with aura sparkling around a form constant tunnel. On the left is a work by Victor Vassarelli, often called the founder of optical art. Here, as in our red and blue spirals, he capitalizes on the processing instability created in our minds by two juxtaposed, highly saturated colors far apart on the spectrum. And the next. I think the closest modern parallels to the collected and collected visions of the top floor of SD3 are the skylit galleries of the Vassarelli Foundation. As with our spirals, his murals gain momentum from the connections made one to the other back and forth across the space or through the open doorways to other displays. The next. I suggest that whatever was going on in our Thuring building started on the top floor. Again, we have a modern guide and hallucinatory memory sequence painted by a South American tribesman. Let's follow some theorems through Zesty 3 I see them consuming a psychoactive substance, perhaps served in the heirloom marble bowl found there. Their initial visions would have been geometric optical illusions and scintillating form constants, their effect heightened by the huge red and blue spirals and dizzying rosettes. As their psychedelic experience progressed, their visions would have transitioned to more figurative ones, ebbing and flowing in hallucinatory vibrancy, room after room on the floors below. The next. There are still so many questions, but I hope that my case studies convinced you and may encourage others to seek the psychedelic elsewhere in Aegean Bronze Age art. To this end, I conclude as I began with a quotation from Sir Arthur Evans, here reflecting on the fantastic ceilings from Zacro. Quote, the types shift and transform themselves like the phantoms of a dream. 
A facing sphinx takes shape again as a winged cherub with lion's feet. But hey, presto, the new impersonation in turn dissolves itself. And so the metamorphoses proceed. Thank you. Thank you for that, Karen. Um, I hope to segue now from uh, your wonderful presentation uh, to some of the things that we're doing in the field. Um, I want to start with some uh, definitions and some background. Uh, what do I mean by an invisible archaeology? Um, what, what I mean is a new approach to detecting some of the psychedelia, ancient pharmacology and medicine that Dr. Foster referred to. Uh, these uh, case studies I'll present, three of them span over the past two decades. And I want to end with also talking about some new directions uh, we could go to in the coming years. Uh, first of all, I want to start with the premise that we have indeed undoubtedly discovered archaeological evidence for psychedelia. Some of you are familiar with recent discoveries such as uh, evidence for the use of psychedelics uh, associated with cave paintings. And it is my um, suspicion and premise that there is actually much more uh, than we have actually uh, presented and published. And I'll go into some of the reasons why. Uh, so the more pertinent question is how much has been actually misconstrued, overlooked, or even downplayed? And what I want to present today is that a transdisciplinary approach, which I'll explain in a second, overcomes uh, the siloed outlooks that have hindered um, a better understanding of how we can discern and better understand uh, psychedelia in the ancient world in the past in general. So what exactly is transdisciplinarity? Uh, I want to start by saying it's distinct from disciplines working in parallel. So multidisciplinarity, where different specialists kind of do their own thing and they might meet at the end, or even in dialogue with each other interdisciplinarity. Um, I want to stress that there is this qualitative difference because oftentimes we think that uh, these adjectives or describers are just an intensive saying transdisciplinarity is just more of working with others. But um, I propose that in the way I define it, it actually means a new way to approach um, how we study the past. So in fact, it's the seamless fusion of disciplines uh, to create a novel unified approach resulting in newly obtainable results. So the idea of obtaining new information is really at the crux of the matter. And what's been driving uh, this transdisciplinary approach is organic residue analysis, or aura. Uh, it's been the engine driving my own research for the past couple of decades. To start off, what are we dealing with when we talk about ancient pharmacopoeia? First of all, organics were central and very prevalent uh, in the ancient world, but are no now largely invisible. So if you look at this poster um, that uh, a team member of mine led a couple years ago, you can see that uh, it's your ubiquitous pottery that you discover all over uh, the ancient world. But what we do by using this uh, transdisciplinary approach is make this mute pottery come alive. So rather than just viewing it as an Egyptian style jar, in fact, we detected honey in there. So why is that honey in, in, in this jar, so on and so forth. So I will explain uh, with my examples soon, what ramifications this transdisciplinary approach has. Uh, also, we know about modern pharmacopoeia that as we uh, see with products such as Moroccan oil, that these organic goods from this region are still abundant and increasingly valued today. Uh, I learned about Moroccan oil from my, uh, my, my wife um, and it's a perfect example of how complex this idea of ancient pharmacopoeia might be. In this example of Moroccan oil, um, it's a company based in London who sources the raw materials from Morocco, hence its name, but it's actually manufactured in uh, the modern country of Israel. So you can see uh, the, the complex interplay between the different locations, and it very much reflects what I believe happened in the past. So the ultimate question is how much can we retrieve uh, from antiquity in terms of understanding pharmacopoeia, psychedelia, et cetera. In essence, where can we go after these two past decades of foundational research? So I had some initial questions concerning psychedelia and ecstatic experiences in the ancient world that kind of riffs off what Dr. Stang mentioned at the start. 
Uh, I want to kind of focus it more in, in my realm of research. So, for example, did the peoples and cultures of antiquity view these phenomena the same way as us? How much do our modern worldviews and sensibilities affect our ability to perceive and interpret ancient evidence? To what degree can we understand the fundamental nature and role of these phenomena in ancient societies? And finally, to what extent can we unravel the ramifications any understanding holds for us today? And I hope to start addressing these questions um, by using these case studies and to give you an idea of the complexities and the challenges that we face as we try to really uh, grasp the, this past evidence and have it come to bear on our present and future. I want to start with probably my earliest major project dealing with organic, uh, ancient organic residues and discerning what this evidence means. Um, it occurred in, in the eastern part of Crete, right in the center of the Eastern Mediterranean, really at the crossroads between the Aegean world that Dr. Foster just mentioned, here is Thera, and the ancient Near East, Cyprus, Egypt, et cetera. So this is really the, the theater of my research for the past 20 years. So the question I ask is, what's in a name? So this gives you an example of some of the hurdles that we face in recognizing this psychedelia. So this research was the, the, the topic of my dissertation at the University of Pennsylvania. It concerned a late Bronze Age building uh, at a site called Moklas, a harbor town in East Crete. Uh, affiliated with what we call the Minoan peoples. Um, and it deals with this room five. Uh, you can see the state of affairs here on the right when it was excavated approximately 20 years ago. Uh, this was after it was clean, but the vessels for the most part were left. Um, there was a jar that was very interesting that was found right in this region. Initially, um, my job here was just to be the survey supervisor. It was not to do any kind of scientific research of this sort. Uh, but I saw this room and something piqued my interest about it, that there was something uh, perhaps unusual. Uh, the initial analysis, to give you an idea of how archaeology works, is everyone said, for the most part, this is a wine press room. Let's chalk it up to that and let's move on. We have other things to do. And th uh, this was the, 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 the supposition for good reason. Uh, because at the second phase of this building on the left, they found this cache of these large jars that are over half a meter tall. And these jars have been widely recognized to be wine jars. So they quickly said there's a vat, that's where they pressed the, wine, the grapes to make the wine. Never mind that it's from a different era of the building, approximately a generation apart. So uh, nevertheless, they amused me and they allowed me to take organic residue samples from these various vessels. So I presumed, uh, I automatically assumed that we would find wine based upon everything pointing to it. And that's how it would have been published if I hadn't inter intervened. But the science tells us something different. The organic residues point to the fact that there is no evidence for wine. In fact, what these compounds point to is some kind of olive oil-based aromatic. You can see the olive oil uh, remnants and then all these botanical ingredients. So where the discussions then automatically leapt to is a, a perfumed oil workshop. Um, this is a somewhat of a technical term in the discipline um, based upon uh, tablets that, were, that have been discovered in the past and named such because of the ingredients that these tablets list. Um, but what I want to propose today is that even this name, I think, should be called into question. So here are some of the ingredients, and they, in fact, do reflect the ingredients in these tablets that were written down uh, as inventory at, at a workshop in the mainland of Greece. And you can see, for the most part, it reflects an aromatic production uh, until I would propose you look at some of the details. And by the way, one of the ingredients in this, uh, this workshop was uh, from Cretan rock row, Cystus criticus, which is actually displayed in the Zesty 3 building that Dr. Foster had just mentioned. So with that having the context that Dr. Foster just described, that immediately gives a clue that something else might be going on in this workshop, other than making perfumed oils. For instance, wormwood was one of the ingredients. And as we know, it's, it was described in great detail by later historians and scientists, uh, for instance, by Dioscorides when he describes the qualities and, and the 
the effects of wormwood. Many of you might be familiar with it um, as it relates to absence, for instance. So once again, evidence that this is something more uh, than perhaps what we would call a perfumery or something like that. But let's go, let me, let me outline here an example, going back to the tablets, of how a transdisciplinary approach can really change our understanding of the evidence. So this is the very tablet that has come to give name to this type of industry in this late Bronze Age Aegean world, the perfumed oil workshop tablet from the site of Pylos in Southwest mainland Greece. So this is the transliteration of the tablet. It's uh, done in the earliest surviving um, evidence we have for the earliest Greek. Uh, so it's related to ancient classical Greek, but a century earlier. And you can see one of the earliest translations in 1985 by Dr. Cynthia Shelmerdine. Um, and she writes thus, uh, Akotas gave to Thyestes the perfume boiler aromatics for perfume destined for boiling. So as you know, there's a subjective aspect of translating these texts. Um, and oftentimes, especially this early stage of the Greek language, we often don't know the exact uh, definition of some of these terms. So it's very much flavored and colored by our preconceived notions of what this should be. So automatically you see things like, here's the list of ingredients at the bottom of the tablets. And when you see things like coriander and other uh, evidence for botanicals, you automatically assume this is a perfumery. Uh, but you can, to give you an idea of how complex this process is, um, 30 years later, uh, Tom Palaima translated as Akosota gave incense materials to Thyestes, the unguent boiler, so they might be boiled. Um, here I agree with Dr. Shelmerdine that unguent isn't correct because the ideogram afterward shows a liquid and unguents of course are solid at room temperature, but Regardless, the other aspects kind of shows you that perfume is actually not set in stone in the translation. So there's very much a subjective um, way and a, and a connotation that we bring out that often isn't displayed in these translations. Uh, but with this transdisciplinary approach, we have new evidence. So here are the, the vessels associated with the workshop that I mentioned just earlier. And you can see what the science and other evidence can do in terms of affecting things like translations. Because for example, here we can see how this funnel was used with this vat. And one thing fascinating about the science is that there was evidence for cholesterol and other kinds of lipids in this funnel, but none in this vessel, the vat, the main part itself. So this actually, I believe, reflects the ingredients in this tablet because they've never been able to figure out why is wool attached to, to these lists of ingredients. What I propose, in fact, is that the wool was placed in this funnel as a filter of sorts. I do believe this is also honey because I have a proposed uh, purpose for it, but I won't get into that right now. But with this additional information, using the ingredients from uh, the science, combining it with the original Mycenaean Greek, uh, as preposterous as it is, um, I have proposed a new translation. You gotta understand that Professor Shelmerdine is one of the foremost experts in ancient perfumes and uh, Tom Palaima was probably the expert in Aegean scripts. So for me to propose a different translation normally would be absolutely preposterous, but I have the advantage of having this in, uh, additional information. So the way I would translate it is Akusota gave pharmacopoeic materials to Thyestes, the ointment maker, literally oil boiler is what it is, not perfumer, for infusing or the infusion process. So right away, you can see that this really calls into question the identification of these workshops as perfumed oil workshops. In my opinion, they're more akin to something like an apothecary or even a lab. So then that starts to get you thinking, what else have we perhaps misinterpreted or misconstrued through our research and siloed kind of outlooks. There's another mystery with this context, and it's the fact that um, ferulic acid was found in the vessel. The science doesn't lie. The toughest part is trying to figure out where it came from. Uh, it perhaps could be as simple as giant fennel, 
but giant fennel is usually used for culinary purposes. So it doesn't fit with the, the character of, of any of these, whether the texts or the archeology. span So perhaps we should look at other areas. For instance, another Frula plant is Asafetida. And you can see this much more fits along the lines of an apothecary or something like that. It has more of these medicinal effects. And what's fascinating is when you go to the roughly contemporaneous time period, we even have another frula plant that's even more fascinating, uh, ancient sylphium. It is, was renowned in antiquity because it only grew in ancient Libya in the Brackish coast and was more valuable than gold. It, it was valuable enough that they overharvested it, over it to extinction. And the legend goes that the last surviving example was given to the emperor Nero as a curiosity. It, provide enough money to the, the site of Cyrene, they were able to mint their own coins and gave them this vast wealth based upon this one product. And also because of its extinction, it rapidly declined going into late antiquity. Uh, what did it do? Why was it so valuable? Um, here's another fascinating thing. Pliny, the historian, Pliny the Elder, he actually kind of dances around what it did, but we get clues. And there are probably reasons why he didn't come out and say it. But from what we can tell, it was probably the most powerful abortifacient in antiquity, um, judging by the qualities of other frulas. So once again, this is clearly an example of something that is not culinary or just uh, an aromatic simply, but perhaps something much more. In case this seems like a jump and a leap, there's actually contextual archeological support for this potential. And the fact that next to the workshop at Moklas I just described, they found multiple seal sto stones, as you can see here, and here's the impression it makes, um, depicting silphium seeds. Nobody doubts this. So once again, why are they depicting silphium seeds in the exact same time period next door, which again, uh, lends credibility to the fact that they might have been brewing something, making something with silphium as a major ingredient centuries before it was leveraged to extinction by the people in the classical periods. So perfumed oil workshop, that's how it is in the record books. But to me, with the new evidence, in, in looking here with my uh, mapping of the context, it very much more looks like a lab of sorts. Uh, there's no context ever found like this so far. Um, if you were just making wine, you would just have the vat there. You wouldn't have it ensconced like an installation. You wouldn't have this nice platform, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we got to start rethinking what this evidence means. Um, and even contrasting it with tomb paintings, which have always been considered perfume making, but once again, what are these additional processes that have never been commented upon? A second case study is uh, the challenge of interpretation. So in addition to preconceived notions of what the evidence might mean, even when we're presented with the inter interpretation right in front of us, it doesn't necessarily mean that we'll take it to heart and then reevaluate what it might all mean. So I wanna take you now to a ritual site in the center of the Peloponnese of Greece before we head to the ancient Near East. Um, it's a site of, site of Mount Lycaon, one of the earliest sanctuaries to Zeus. They even claim that that's in fact where the god Zeus was born. Regardless, uh, there's a lower and upper sanctuary. The lower sanctuary is mainly classical, but the upper sanctuary goes back approximately 4,000 years all the way to the Bronze Age. And it's up here in the upper sanctuary, some of the most intriguing evidence came up. Um, it's very difficult to make out, but all of these little pieces and a lot of this, and also in the back, it's not stone or pebbles, it's burnt bone. So th these altar, this altar was constantly burning sacrifices over millennia, um, presumably uh, to, even with Zeus, all the way going back to the Bronze Age. So it leads to a lot of interesting questions about the continuity of cult, of ritual, et cetera. So this was approximately 10, 15 years ago when I was asked to study this. 
So this was found up in the altar. It's not these vessels itself, but I want to show what these vessels might look like. Uh, this is a kylix or kylikes. And unsurprisingly, there was wine in one of the body sherds. So that's how we were going to publish it. But what was absolutely fascinating is this sample. There were additional samples, had this very tall, unusual peak. And every evidence points to it being colchicine. There is a challenge of this interpretation, which is why I first started to think that this has to be done in the transdisciplinary way and not just relying on the science, is that here is a nice reference, chemical reference of colchicine, the mass spectrum of it. And you can see when you're dealing with degraded ancient samples that are over 3000 years old, though the fragmentation patterns are an exact match, the, the, the quantities can be a little tricky. So this is when you got to look at the historical context, the text, and also use, in addition to pure chemical standards, also ethnobotanical standards, ethnographic sa samples, et cetera. So that's when I first started thinking about this, um, to add this additional evidence to fingerprint what you find so it doesn't, uh, it's without doubt believed to be the botanical specimen that is referenced. Um, this method, this transdisciplinary approach, allows you to even nuance uh, storax products, uh, goods, down to exactly the different plant it might have come from. Uh, so it certainly has proven efficacious. Ethnographic references are also important, um, whether you're doing things like oil or wine, uh, murex for purple dye or honey, et cetera, et cetera. So these modern, more modern examples of use of these products can serve as excellent references because they're producing, in essence, the same products that were produced centuries ago. Experimental archaeology helps. There's been a lot of very helpful people who've come and approached us. For example, one was interested in, in, in producing uh, a perfume or aromatic for us using these two different types of resins. And again, serving as a nice reference sample that proves beyond a shadow of doubt what we're finding is, is, is interpreted correctly. So to sum up in terms of culture scene, it's clearly not something that could be construed as just a preservative. Uh, it only naturally de derives from culture come out of Nale. It's poisonous in high doses, yet to this day, it is the best antidote for gout. It's not synthetically produced, but it's actually extracted from culture commodum nali to this day. And it also serves as a remedy for all sorts of ailments that is used to this day, rheumatism, familiar Mediterranean fever, Crohn's disease, lupus, et cetera. So clearly not something that can be clearly, that, that can just easily be put into a category of perfumes or additives for preservation. Once you kind of zoom back out and bring in the ethno history, it gets even more interesting. We know that it was used medicinally as early as 3,500 years ago by the Egyptians. Dioscorides himself confirms that it grew abundantly, really, but in two locations, Messenia, which is right near the site of Mount Lycaon, and Colchis in the Black Sea region. And also legend states that the first example was produced from the blood of Prometheus, and Medea produced a potion from it to protect protect Jason. I'm not saying that this is exactly what happened, but this reference, again, should make us question the categories we've placed some of these ingredients. Um, obviously, to the ancients, they had some kind of special meaning. Can we unravel what this meaning uh, actually was conveying, what was actually happening on the ground? Uh, just very quickly, for instance, Colchis is way up here, Mount Lycaon is here. And as a fascinating twist, cultures, of course, connected directly to the myth uh, of Medea and the Golden Fleece and all that. So this is an allegory. This can not only illuminate uh, topics such as psychedelia, but also the ritual practices, the mythology. And that's really what makes it absolutely fascinating to me. So the final interpretation of culture, uh, culture scene spiked wine is a poison, ritual, medicine, fertility, all of the above. Uh, that's something that we're going to determine now, since this evidence is increasingly pointing in this direction. Uh, but nevertheless, the interpretation part is always tricky for the reasons I mentioned. Uh, my final case study, uh, psychoactive potions. This gives you an uh, idea, once again, similar to the first example, when you have an idea of what 
the evidence should be or has traditionally been interpreted to be that can often put bl blinders on or guardrails in terms of really thinking clearly about what this evidence might mean. So this takes us to the Levant, to the Upper Galilee, to a Middle Bronze Age palace from almost 4,000 years ago. Uh, I gave a talk um, on this around five years ago at Harvard. So I'm not gonna go too much into the details since that video is online. Uh, but what I do wanna focus on is not so much the simple evidence for wine, but once again, this transdisciplinary approach and how we can rethink where psychedelia exists and how we can better discern it in the, the, the empirical evidence. So uh, this is a very fortuitous discovery in the sense, uh, anytime you discover something that changes the very definition of, of something as important as, as the wine industry, viticulture, and et cetera, here in the New York Times, it's of course something that uh, you're very thankful for because then you can ask questions that you normally can't ask. So here we are in 2013 field sampling these multitude of jars, thousands and thousands of liters of, of wine. And as many of you might know, um, the evidence clearly shows wine, unlike at Moklos, it's not an aromatic. Uh, the base was wine. But what I wanna focus on today, unlike last time I presented this, is the rest of it that I just kind of glossed over. All of these ingredients, uh, very complex. And this is probably just a portion of a dozen or more ingredients that was added in this interesting context. Once again, we get more clues that help us interpret the context, in this case, from contemporaneous ethno-historical references, as diverse as Egyptian kaifi recipes. So uh, this concoction that was first mentioned as early as the, um, the Old Kingdom and the pyramid tax, all the way to um, the later classical periods, the Roman even, we see here that it mentions that the recipe includes things like honey, wine, raisins, kaipira, so things that we found in this context, but I want to point to this last sentence, the fact that uh, it's mentioned not as just a simple beverage, but a potion and a salve. It's taken internally to cleanse internal organs, so on and so forth. So again, a very medicinal context for this type of wine. The contemporary Mari tablets kind of shows the same thing, goes strong wines, sweet wines. And then it talks about three major categories uh, depending on the herbal aromatics added to it, coming from some kind of oil from Cyprus, myrtle oil, and a juniper oil. So once again, it's, it's clearly showing that these lines are blurred between a simple beverage, uh, alcoholic or not, and beyond that, these botanicals that are added to it. So like I originally concluded years ago, so it's a room, the room was a place of wine cellar, but for what? Uh, it contained these resonated herbal wines. Uh, what, what do these herbal wines mean? Is it as simple as just making regular wine for export as displayed here in the contemporaneous Egyptian tomb? Um, but if you look at the context here, it very much seems more similar to the first context I showed you at Moklos. Uh, there's a platform. There were measuring cups found just at, like at Moklos, ladles, bowls. And it's clear that this isn't just a simple um, uh, production facility, a little simple line, but there's somebody with some knowledge here. Um, they're at the platform and as jars come in, they're, they're adding these botanicals that we found. And we know this because the jars that are further uh, south here, um, they don't contain any of the botanicals. So it's clear that's coming from wherever the wine was fermenting. And before consumption, they were adding all these botanicals to it. Once again, it sounds like more than a simple winery or simple facility just for nourishment. We get additional evidence to support this. Is it the same as simple household feasting like here? Um, I would, I would say because of the context, once again, the wine cellar is here. There was a fancy building with ashlar masonry and orthostats here, uh, which was probably akin to this kind of elite feasting context uh, with a bovine that was sacrificed. Um, so what I would propose is that they were adding things to this wine 
that we're only just beginning to understand. It's not just simply resonated wine, but they're clearly adding these botanicals for effect. And I think the sooner that we kind of have that perspective, uh, the more likely we're going to make these discoveries and be able to present it in a coherent manner. So in sum, uh, this transdisciplinary approach, it provides fresh answers and high resolution. It allows us to recover ancient organics, to reveal humanity's past, to inform our present. It can answer questions related to ecology and what the sourcing of these organics do, because we know uh, just as with the sylphium um, plant, uh, there was much denuding of force to produce some of these items. We know we can talk about manufacturing and innovation, the recipes themselves, potentially, and also what this means on a more global scale, on a local and global scale, the exchange and consumption, are people uh, uh, consuming the same products, same goods when they're exported thousands of miles away? Um, how is the technology and the, the notion of these items uh, transferred, branding, market demand, et cetera? We can also reconstruct the paleo environment, paleoecology, uh, which we see that clearly in one example where they changed one ingredient a couple of centuries later, perhaps due to aridification. And perhaps what's most uh, interesting for our audience today, the, what ramifications this has for economic and social cultural practices, whether it's localized rituals, scentscapes, as, as some have called it. I would call it something like perhaps psychedelia scapes. And ultimately, perspectives on modern life and corresponding applications, as Dr. Stang mentioned at the very start. So I hope this was just uh, an example. This might be new information for many of you. We are just starting in many ways, but I feel with this approach really coming to the forefront, we can make incredible headways to finally answer the question of, can archeology span answer and discern questions related to ancient psychedelia? Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So if I don't want to cut short, oh, there you go. I don't want to cut short your beautiful closing slide there, but there we go. If you would, and Karen, if you would please turn on your audio and video now, we'd like to have you join the conversation. There's Karen. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you both so much. What I'm going to propose um, uh, is that um, I'm going to invite you each to ask the other any questions you have, because you two are uh, experts and you may have questions that would be illuminating for those of us who aren't experts. But if, and, and while you're doing that, I will mine the questions that people have submitted. There's a good number here. But before that, Andrew, there's one question that I wanna ask you. Well, first of all, let me say, Karen, I've gotten a number of requests from people to know the names of the artists that you um, cited, the modern artists. And I suggest <laughs> they email you directly for that. Um, uh, people are quite interested in that. Um, so Andrew, there's one thing that I, and at least one other person of the hundreds of attending this event missed, and that is when you mentioned the sylphium, that is the, the in the Firola family, that the, the one that's from Libya that was over harvested to extinction, mm -hmm. you said that it was the most important something and that this and that that it perhaps changed our understanding of what uh, this what was being done um, in this site. But I missed what it, what what's the effect that you think Pliny is sort uh -huh. of talking around. Well, it's, it's not just plenty. It's, it's a very fascinating topic. I think uh, it's, it's not really my focus, but it's, there's, I'm sure, plenty of articles that could be written because plenty, as you know, is very verbose, right? He, he goes <laughs> into, and to the point of exaggeration, perhaps, right? So it's, if anything, it sticks out because he is so squirrely about describing what it does. So it's, it's obviously something that might be maybe something considered taboo or something like that. But we have other evidence. For instance, um, I, I, this, this is the human aspect of this fascinates me. So um, I'm not even sure how I could go there. I don't normally read Ovid. I don't do that much Latin, to be honest with you. I'm sorry, Charlie, but- um, Neither uh, do I. I don't oh, like good. that. Oh, okay, good, good. Okay, so <laughs> one of, I love this one uh, description by Ovid. Um, I, I believe it was Ovid who says, uh, 
if those two keep going at it, they're going to need some sulfium. Say that again. If those two keep going at it, they're going to need some sulfium. And we know uh -oh. what ferula acephatida does. It's much weaker. But what we think is, and this is probably, I, I went through a little bit too fast. We think sulfium back then, of course, but even today, if it existed, would be the most powerful abortifacient, the morning okay. after pill. Okay. That, All that's... the evidence points to it, it, it basically mm -hmm. serving that function. Okay. Yes. That Someone asked precisely that question um, and you did move by it fast. And we, so I'm glad we came back to it. So that, that okay. So that's the possible um, kind of uh, uh, use of that. All right. Fascinating. All right. So I'm going to invite you each uh, to ask each other questions. And uh, meanwhile, I'll prepare some questions from the audience. So Karen... Right. Well, I don't, why don't, Andrew, why don't you um, ask any questions you might have of Karen and then uh, Karen in turn can ask you. Great. Karen, I had one um, that's kind of, uh, I've been thinking about with your wonderful presentation is I'm thinking about Harvard's own Emily Vermeule, who had commented, mm -hmm. um, you know, she's a legend, right? She's one of the reasons why I got into all this. And she had mentioned the fact that there's so much in ancient art and in particular Aegean art that involves the individual and strange. I love the way she kind of phrases it that way, as in pr presumably back decades ago, it's, it was even much more difficult to talk about some of these interpretations and what's actually going into art than it is today. Um, in your opinion, when she talks about the strange and kind of dances around, and we all know what it is, right, in general, but when she dances around that, in your opinion, how much kind of, kind of relate to what I just talked about over the decades of people have studied this art, especially the even Akrotiri as a lot of that's so recent, how much do you think our, as a society, our, whatever you want to call it, our culture, our morals or whatever, have kind of filtered and affected the way we discover and interpret these scenes? And it, it doesn't just have to be Theron art, of course, it could even go back mm -hmm. generations earlier. Right. Well, that's a, that's a wonderful question. Um, and to answer that, I think I will tell you a small story. Um, when the Thera wall painting symposium took place um, uh, on the island of Thera, um, they arranged a display of what had been restored at that point, and this is now going back uh, 15, 18 years now, of, of some of these uh, monumental wall paintings. And um, they were photographed with a good friend, uh, of a somewhat older generation. Now, I, who came of age in the famous 60s, um, looked at these and said, wow, they are so psychedelic. And she looked at me, <gasps> drew herself up and said, oh no, oh no, that couldn't possibly be. So that sort of sat in my mind for a very long time. And um, as you all probably know, um, we, that is to say, two co-editors and I have a book about to come out called Ecstatic Experience in the Ancient World. And it has uh, 27 chapters on the subject of ecstatic experience indeed. Um, and so that seemed to me a perfect opportunity to go back to what my impression had been when I looked at these images. And to my absolute delight, um, Andreas Vakopoulos and his incredibly talented uh, restorer artist um, uh, had also in the course of years of restoring these works come to very similar conclusions, particularly about the Zesty Three. And it was just wonderful to think that, um, that that's, it, it really is there. It really is there. And, with that, I began looking at other examples of Aegean art to see what was there. And of course, I went back to Kamara, I swear, and Gisela Wahlberg, who is again, a um, slightly older generation um, and um, uh, not prone to flights of fancy at all, um, shall we say, um, in that seminal work on Kamara, where she said, well, this just isn't Kamara. I, I don't know what it's doing here, but it's just not Kamaris. And when I began looking into psychedelic vocabulary, visual vocabulary, that is, I said, wait a minute, these are form constants. They are absolutely part 
of psychedelic vocabulary. They're absolutely part of Gemara syntax. Does that, no, no, do those two no, 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 stories sort of help you. answer your question, I think, I hope? It, or it does. I mean, questions of other people. To even when I think about uh, Kamars, where um, I, I remember in my younger days, uh, you could probably relate to this. Uh, we want to recreate perhaps what they're doing at Kamars Cave. So we hiked from Faritza all the way up. And we spent the night up at the cave. Um, it, wow. uh, yeah, and then when you when you go into the cave, it, it, it clearly is a sanctuary, a ritual site. I mean, it, there's something going on there. I mean, they're bringing the wealth up. And again, it, I, it, I mean, again, I know more of the archaeology side, of course, than the art side. But um, I, I kind of, uh, as we joked, uh, could you do this uh, if you were completely sober? <laughs> you know, so uh, uh, because it, it, there, mm -hmm. there is something about that side and the context. And are we missing? some of this, because some of these sites were dug in the Victorian era, right? Well, 1890s, yeah, exactly, yeah. right. Although, although Evans, um, as you heard in both my opening and, and concluding quotations from him, he was, he was absolutely right on it. Hmm. Yes, he, he was absolutely on it. That last slide, that's mine of, um, on, the, on the left, those blue, magic mushrooms were actually in our back garden. Um, <laughs> it's been an amazing year for mushrooms. Um, and then yes. when you look at those, yeah, hasn't it? It's, uh, it, it's, it's uncanny mm -hmm. uh, here in New England. It's like an, a, a bumper crop of the fungus is taking over uh, and, the forest. And kinds, I've never, kinds I've never seen before. Really. Amazing, yeah. Mm -hmm. But there they were. And when you look at those Zocro, um, uh, that that glyptic from Zacro, and you look at those right next to those magic mushrooms. Um, I, I hope it didn't go by too fast, but it's really just inescapable. So I'm I'm kind of hoping that others will be encouraged to look at other aspects of the G and art and say, hey, wait a minute, that's that's probably what's going on here, um, and that's that's kind of. Um, I mean, I did these two case studies, but obviously there are lots more, and I and I. And I would think that some in the audience are, are sort of beginning to, you know, wonder about that. Good, great. Well, you bring up a good point just quickly: is that uh, in it, from the time of those uh, the wall paintings that Dr. Foster brought up to and and the workshop I mentioned in let's say around 1450, I mean there are 1600 BCE, uh, it got it's it precipitously got more arid. So that's because, mm -hmm. so, so you got to ask where the ingredients starting to be missing and how are they adapt? So that's, that's one of the reasons why I went to this earlier time period because I knew that a lot of the people would say, well, we don't think this plant grew. Well, mm -hmm. when you go to the Akrotiri, you know, the nilotic scenes, they call them, it's been totally fanciful. I'm beginning to doubt that, that that wasn't just an imaginary landscape, but because of the climate being so much wetter, that that's something we got to rethink, I, I believe. I think what's one of the things that's so, uh, fascinating about both your presentations is that they're invitations to reassess evidence um, and recategorize things. In some, in some sense, it's, it feels as if we're on the cusp of the threshold of a reassessment of things that we thought we knew well. Um, so if, can I jump in, Andrew, and ask Karen a question, um, which is a sort of a comparative question. And, and, and Karen, I don't know if this will go beyond your um, expertise. This is from James Woodruff, uh, he wants to know whether you see similar artistic motifs in indigenous art from pre-Columbian peoples in the Western, in the, in the Americas, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. And um, so what evidence do we have that these motifs, ancient or less so, can be attributed to the use of entheogens? So, you know, you, you've made this case by putting side to side ancient Near Eastern and modern art suggesting that the ancient might be inspired by psychedelia. If that's the case, we would expect a similar sort of that recurrence of those motifs in other places where we um, think entheogens uh, were, were, were uh, mm -hmm. used. So do you have thoughts on that? Um, I do. Um, those two slides, uh, two of the slides that I showed toward the end um, mm -hmm. did include images um, made by um, folks in the Amazon region, um, mm -hmm. Amazon that is the river, not um, <laughs> the global monolith. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. um, and 
Um, I wish there was some way that we could look at those two again to answer this question. Um, Nick, is there any way that we could get back to this or is this hopelessly? No, I don't think well, that's whatever. Difficult. Nick, okay. can, you, can you share um, Karen's PowerPoint again and she can it's walk way, through? It's, it's yeah. almost at the end and right. there was um, uh, a yarn image um, from, um, from some tribes uh, people of the Amazon Orinoco region. And then there was also just the second slide from the end was, yeah, way down. Um, yes, keep going. Keep going. Um, keep going. Oh. I load a little bit, I think. Yeah. It's okay, been, um, I know there's such big on. images, but wait, it's, yes, wait. Um, number 28. Okay, number 28 will I think answer that part of it. Yeah. Okay. So the one down in the lower right is a yarn image um, made um, specifically to commemorate um, a psychedelic experience that this person had. And if you look then up at the spirals, can you see that we have just the same um, sort of tunnel form constants but mm -hmm. in the sort of hooks of the spirals. Do you see that? I wish mm -hmm. I could point somehow. Um, but you can you can see that I think quite clearly, even the same colors that sort of radiating um, those sort of radiating motifs. And then if you look at um, slide 30, can you do that? Yeah. Um, so the upper one is the record um, that was made, uh, this painting, the record that was made by this individual whom you see there in the upper, um, in the upper right. Um, and those are exactly the kinds of images that he had in the, um, what shall we say, the, um, the more geometric uh, phase of hallucinatory images. We, they, they're, um, our colleagues in the cognitive neurosciences tell us that hallucinations, um, uh, generally speaking, they go from uh, form constants to much more um, uh, representational imagery. And so this is this is the beginning of his sort of trip. But neither of those are, those are contemporary instances. Do we have any pre-Columbian, um, uh, so to speak, uh, oh, I see. art um, from the Americas? Well, I'm gonna leave that to my pre-Columbian colleagues. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, okay. But okay, certainly- so fascinating question. Yeah, the, the the continuity of experience there is I is, is I think something um, that you um, should find, but I'll, I'll leave that part. But certainly in the modern era, um, the correspondences are, are I think really telling and compelling. Um, I want to tell you that Brian Murrescu is is joining us, and he says not a question but a comment for Karen. Bravo! I'm going to correct his uh, oh, bravo, but uh, thrilling oh, presentation. Reminiscent of the once controversial, now archaeochemically substantiated work of Davis Lewis, Lewis Williams. And Brian says, I'm so excited to read the, the Rutledge Companion to Ecstatic Experience in the Ancient World, just pre-ordered for hardcover. So I put the title of the book okay. in the chat. So uh, anyone else who's Great. interested, it is the Rutledge Companion to Ecstatic Experience in the Ancient World. I've seen the table of contents. It's going to be amazing. It is amazing. I just don't have my hands on it yet. All right. Um, we don't. We don't either. <laughs> but <laughs> yes, it's, right. it's 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 oh the end the end is in sight. We're just at the absolute final stages of tweaking, you know, the page proofs and so forth. And you'll be happy to know that the cover girl is um, is that first Kamara swear pot. Here's a question for, I think this goes for either of you, but I'm guessing that, um, Andrew, you might want to take a stab at it first, given your piece about transdisciplinarity. So this is from James Lowry, and there's an, another version. I'll, I'm going to combine two questions. Did the peoples of the ancient Mediterranean, either through epigraphy or iconography, make explicit reference to psychotropic substances? So another way of putting that is, do we have any textual evidence for what we're calling, for better or worse, psychedelics? And Andrei Irapatov, if I'm saying your name right, asks or comments, it seems that the psychedelic experience is absent from the written texts we have access to. Is this a symptom of historic censorship? 
or the very nature of the subject matter that in every era it was in some way underground, whether it was uh, legally prohibited as today or um, a sort of esoteric secret la much as was held in the Eleusinian mysteries. So uh, maybe just one way to put it is, what's the textual record? And if there's not a thick textual record, how do we explain that? They're kind of, they're, I mean, uh, kind of referring to what I referenced before, there is a good textual record. Um, but again, as uh, I tried to point out in, in, in short time is that um, I think the interpretation is, is, is partially the that filter I talked about. So oftentimes texts that are that I would consider in this realm are put into things like magic or, you know, as you know, um, yeah. especially when you go to the early Christian age. So when, when you even go, I, I talked about Plutarch, for instance, uh, he has all the, he has, a, he has one of the best accounts. It's exactly what I referenced to when he talks about Egypt and you can imagine the filters it goes through. So basically you have a, a Greek person group in a Roman world looking at ancient Egyptian culture that's then translated, interpreted by whoever we are, right? For the last hundred years. So you can imagine through that type of filter, um, uh, by the time it gets to us, it's either kind of put into this nonsense category, I'd say almost, like this is just wishful, like voodoo medicine, or it's, you know, if it even gets to us. So uh, one of the more people doing this and, uh, and another question is why are you doing this in the humanities in a place like now? And the reason for that is as I have, to, as much as I have to understand the chemical reactions and all that and know the archeological context, I got to know the original languages and, try, and it's painful, right? To, to learn like a, a dozen languages because, but if you don't do that, then you're reliant on the English and it's going through all these filters, as I mentioned. So um, I, I would like to encourage um, more and more uh, students uh, and, and scholars to kind of think about that. And hopefully we can start removing some of these filters and, and reinvestigating how these things were presented in the past. And even if reading something as simple as the Ebers papyrus or even the Vienna Dioscorides, it's, oh, this is very scientific, but then why does, why does this person, why does the author then go into this magic territory? Yeah. And my suspicion is that a lot of that is actually to them. I don't think they differentiated. Right. And then oh. Yeah, go on. I'm sorry, I cut you no, off. No, no, no. That's, that's, yep. So hopefully they answer the question. Um, Walter Honegraaff from the University of Amsterdam last year mm -hmm. in the series last year speaking about the so-called Mithras liturgy, um, which was uh, uh, um, a text so named by the German scholar who first uh, published an influential study of it, I believe, in the early 20th century, but it's probably not actually a Mithraic text and it's probably not a liturgy. But one thing it includes is a, a, a detailed um, uh, recipe for an eye ointment that will catalyze visions of the god Helios. Um, and, and so a, a fascinating text that, again, it, uh, sort of has been pushed to the margins and miscategorized. So that's one. But the, the Q&A function is actually exploding with people who are telling me that um, there's ample textual evidence um, uh, that apparently none of us are reading. Um, so we have uh, Galen um, uh, cited, uh, Ammon Hillman is uh, saying we need to read Galen. Um, others are saying, of course, many of the stories in the Odyssey, that, now that's a long, that's long been thought uh, to um, some of the episodes in the Odyssey could be, could be construed as evidence for psychedelia. Um, well, can I just say one small thing? Yes, oh, please. Yeah, sorry. Um, and that is to say that um, a good half dozen chapters in this, uh, in this book, are by um, people, authors who are presenting evidence exactly, textual evidence exactly from Akkadian, Sumerian, Egyptian, Hittite sources. So we don't have to um, go even as late as Homer. Um, so they're there. And it's pretty exciting what, um, what our colleagues have, uh, have come up with. Good, thank you, Karen. I am very much looking forward to digging into that volume and perhaps we can have a follow-up event to sort of dig into some of the other chapters in it as well. Okay. Um, Robert, Rich, I'm sorry, Richard Rauschenbusch has asked whether anyone, I'm, I, I'm not I'm looking for the comment here, but I can remember it. Basically, has anyone experimented with recreating some of these infused wines um, 
or other sorts of subject uh, uh, mixtures um, in an attempt to sort of recreate the effects. Uh, either of, yeah, I, I suppose either of you could answer that, but uh, maybe that's closer to your work, Andrew. So why don't you take a stab at it? In terms of, I mean, what's both uh, in one hand, it could it could be discouraging, but it's also exciting. Is I truly do believe we're kind of, uh, and it, your initiative kind of shows the same thing. We're really approaching an exciting time. Right where I feel like it's this pivot, and uh, in addition to the interest, in addition to these kind of uh, outlets such as this, it's are as bad as COVID has been. This idea to connect with people so relatively easily, right? If not in person, um, it, 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 like right now, we're we're I'm working with. I've been working, for instance, with different wineries uh to recreate some of these things we were thinking about this five years ago but what's exciting for me is as much as i would like to just create a wine that is as we define the modern day i would really like to start experimenting with some of the things that i found of this more pharmacological nature mm -hmm. and perhaps it would have been difficult in the past but with smaller wineries and even microbreweries on the beer side you, you see that you, you have these people who are much more interested in, in, in going along with it so uh, we're right in the midst uh, of working with the winery uh, to do some of these kind of things and it's of course as, as fun as that is it's not just about producing the wine but also as I, i'm going through some of the questions here it it, it is also i think important to think about uh, how does this affect what you're going to call it ritual the ecstatic experiences and i think that's the first step right we're i mean um of course much of what you've been discussing especially with like brian moresco is talking about the work of like wasson and hoffman and, and rock and all that and that was like a huge jump but uh we can start i think with smaller things right i mean so i guess we can you can say we're we could be on the road to elusis but let's start like <laughs> with not so much of a light year ahead, you know, jump, but let's talk about the wines and even just getting to the point where it's not just a, a beverage, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's like the first step. And that's kind of, uh, some of the questions are like, tell us what exactly they were doing. Well, we, we I have hypotheses, um, but I think just even get past that initial point would be incredibly helpful. So again, the downside and the upside, right? The downside is, oh my gosh, we have so much more to do, but the upside is now it feels like we, we're gonna be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Great. Karen, was, you have... uh, did, do you remember when Pat McGovern, or maybe this was before mm -hmm. your time at Penn, do you remember when Pat McGovern made wine um, uh, based on uh, textual evidence? Do you remember that? Was that before your time at Penn, maybe? It, it, was, it was kind of right when I was getting going. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, but again, it shows you the, t the timing and the zeitgeist and all that matters, doesn't it? Um, yeah. And he, he was able to produce the, um, the Midas Touch beer with, with <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm allowed to advertise a brewery, but um, it, it's it's and, not it's yeah. beyond a curiosity at this point. And you really yeah. have scientifically minded, intrigued, mm -hmm. you know, uh, very knowledgeable mm -hmm. people across society, whether they're brewers and you know vintners or whatever. And it's really exciting. Yeah, great. Yeah, I think Brian's book does a wonderful job, especially because it reached such a popular audience of sh of making the case that's well known to people in your fields, of course, that um, these ancient beverages had effects well beyond what we think of as just the alcohol proof of, of something that yes. something else is going on with these beverages. That was also news to me. You know, I'm a textualist, so this is that I'm, I'm learning an enormous amount, although I uh, allegedly, um, you know, am a scholar of the ancient world. So I think that goes back to your point, Brian, that there's, um, and yours too, Karen, that with the way we're trained, um, has rendered much of this evidence invisible or at least illegible or read differently. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, just if I could comment real quick, uh, Charlie, I mean, one question and I, it seems to be recurring is something to the effect, well, is it psychedelic or not? Or where's the evidence? And what I've been proposing is I almost wish we could get rid of some of these categories because mm -hmm. I would propose many of these categories are modern. And mm -hmm. as I re referenced before, right, about like, why are we saying this is magic and this is whatever, right? I think we really got to kind of blow that up and kind of start from, in terms of our outlets and perspective and start thinking not so much of these compartments, but the fact that there was much more fluidity back then. And then yeah. that can, I think, really inform what we do now. Yeah, and Brian uses the category, he sort of moves between psychedelic and psychoactive and, and others, I think, in precisely to try to widen this so that we're not 
it's not that we're just after the the substances that we're uh, that are treated in, say, Michael Pollan's book, as if we know mm -hmm. that this is the set of things that we're looking for. We're what I hear from both of you is we're looking for evidence for um, things that can change consciousness uh, embodiment and widely, and that we do not have a sufficient understanding of that spectrum uh, mm -hmm. at all. I, am I hearing you right? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's I think that's very much the case, and um, and there's practical aspects. One quick one I can bring up, uh, hopefully doesn't get me in trouble, is that uh, some people are asking why is this kind of hard. And an example of that that we as academics can relate to is, for instance, when I was publishing an article, hopefully nobody could figure it out, but uh, it was very difficult to really convey clearly what I think the evidence was presenting, because when the reviews come back and they want to edit it, you know, you kind of have to go along with it. But it's clear that the editing wasn't just done from a scholarly perspective, but a cultural one. What I mean by that is, for instance, they didn't want me to use words like psychotropic. Mm. So they, they, in fact, did not want me to use the word psychoactive, but I, that's where I kind of drew the line. They allowed me to use psycho. See, I hate to say that now that people know which journal it is, but, um, but I couldn't, even, I, I had to fight to get psychoactive actually in mm -hmm. my article. Mm -hmm. They wanted to just get rid of those, mm -hmm. you know, those words. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, one, uh, one question that I had at the very beginning of um, when I, when I started putting this putting this together um, was if I or you can agree that something that we're looking at is psychedelic, yeah, according to um, how we'd like to define that, would someone 3,500 years ago or 4,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago have had a similar reaction to mm -hmm. what they were seeing? And I, I really wondered about that. And um, if somebody in the audience could correct me, that would be great. But from all of my uh, reading um, in cognitive and neuroscience and so forth, the answer is our brains are working the same way as they did. So the things that happen inside our brains when we look at these visual instabilities, that we look at these form constants, that that's basically, um, that basically shows that yes, if we are seeing something as psychedelic, they did too. Mm -hmm. Again, with the with the caveat that we want to widen the category of what psychedelic mm -hmm. means from right. how it's typically deployed uh, today. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, that's exactly. a fascinating point. I think we need to wrap up be, and be respectful uh, of the time. Um, and I'm what I'm conscious of now is that Karen, you have asked questions of. Andrew, but we didn't give you the, the, the floor to ask a question of Andrew. Um, but I do feel like we've had a wonderfully uh, fluid discussion here. Um, one thing I'd like to acknowledge from the, the comments is many people are interested in whether and how we could have a parallel conversation about this in the Indian subcontinent, um, mm -hmm. uh, where, of, of course, there's a long standing I mean, obviously, uh, you know, ancient texts and um, and speculation about um, soma and whatnot. So that is an idea for a future um, a future event. Um, but I also want to invite everyone who's still with us to look into this book that uh, Karen is a part of, that edited volume on ecstatic experience um, in, in the ancient Mediterranean world. Is that right? It's it's no, the ancient world. In the ancient world, writ, writ large, wonderful. Okay, are there, so there may are there chapters in there on um, Indian traditions? Did you? Um, no, uh, just peripherally, we have uh, a, a few authors touch on that, but um, we we go as far as Inner Asia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we go as far as Inner Asia, but we don't get further south. And then we, um, of course, the the Near East, Egypt, um, Anatolia, the Aegean. The Greek world, yes, Rome, yes. So it really, it really is. We go to Alexis. Here, here we're back to the ancient world. Uh, in this context, really does mean the ancient Mediterranean world, but it right. stretches into Inner right. Asia. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Wonderful. Well, yes. I want to thank you both so much. Um, this is fascinating work. For those of you who want 
to know more, I think, you know, it's, it's a matter of stay tuned. This is, I'm getting the impression that this is just beginning. Uh, both of these scholars are pioneers um, in some sense, trying to change the, the way the field operates and the way it looks at its own evidence. Um, and I wanna commend you both. And Andrew, I know you and I will collaborate because you're now a neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, and Karen, I commend you for uh, taking a different look at this, this, these materials and challenging the assumptions of our history uh, or art historical scholarship, see these things differently. So, um, and those of you who have attended, thank you so much. I look forward to the next time I see you or rather the next time you see me because I never get to see you. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, <laughs> it's a strange experience, these Zoom webinars where I just look at um, a screen and yet hundreds of people uh, are looking at us. But it's really been um, thrilling to, to learn about this research. And um, thank you once again. So Andrew, Karen, and everyone who's attended, um, good night until the next time. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, bye now. Take care. Sponsors, Center for the Study of World Religions and Esalen. Copyright 2021, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.